I believe the eighth session, oral evidence session for the all party group on coronavirus. Um, and I am delighted uh, to welcome all of our panelists and all of our parliamentarians uh, to this session where we're, we are going to be looking at the international comparisons between the United Kingdom and other countries. Uh, and we have uh, many eminent uh, panel, panelists with us uh, and lots and lots and lots of questions. Um, so thank you so much uh, for all who are watching and especially to those who will be giving evidence. Um, and I'd like to start by uh, giving a very warm welcome to the first uh, two panelists. We'll be talking to them between 11 now and 12.30, at which point we'll move on to the second uh, set of panelists. Um, so in this session, we have Professor Martin McKee, he is the co-director of the core management team at the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Professor McKee uh, will be highlighting the differences between how different countries have responded to the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with the differing solutions and outcomes. And uh, this comes, of course, at a very pertinent week uh, in the United Kingdom, given the uh, interventions yesterday, and I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions about those. Uh, and joining Professor McKee, we've also got Professor Paolo Vines, who is the chair of the environmental epidemiology uh, at Imperial College. Uh, he is the head of the unit of genetic and molecular epidemiology at the Italian Institute for Genomic Medicine in Torino, Italy. And Professor Vines will be reporting on the measures adopted by the Italian government in relation to the change ep changing epidemiology of COVID-19 the evidence of their effects and the challenges faced. So a warm welcome to uh, both of you uh, and also on the call, but we will come to them later, Professor uh, Luca Ricaldi, Professor Sergio Bonini and Professor Dinan Pillai. So thank you uh, all three of you for being with us uh, as well. We'll come to you at 12.30. Um, so I'll kick off uh, by perhaps uh, reflecting over the last week. Uh, it now looks like what this APPG and others had predicted the second wave uh, is here um, and that has led to greater restrictions uh, being announced yesterday, a uh, varying response uh, across the United Kingdom. Uh, we have uh, Prof. Philippa Whitford uh, MP who will be coming in to talk about some of the differences between the four nations later on. She's uh, going to another committee and then coming to us a bit later. Um, but I thought I might start by asking first pro to Professor McKee, but then also uh, to Professor Vines, if there's anything he wants to add. Um, in terms of the uh, changes that have been made by the government in the last 24 hours, in particular uh, with the announcement around the curfew to pubs, um, we were wondering what evidence is there that you're aware of that these restrictions are actually going to help? Um, because when I was looking at the SAGE minutes and the modeling that's been done, as far as I can see, that is not something that I've seen strong evidence for in the minutes that I've seen. I'm wondering, am I missing something? Is this going to work? Well, I, I'm not sure that it will. And maybe it's helpful to go back to first principles. I'm going to say something which is very obvious, but I think needs to be restated. Essentially, this virus transmits in conditions where large numbers of people come together for a period of time in close proximity and particularly indoors. The evidence is that indoor transmission is about 20 times more likely than outdoor transmission and where there is not some form of protection like face covering. Given that, it would tend to direct you towards reducing those settings, be they in places of entertainment or at home uh, with different families coming together or whatever. Recognizing that there are some places that we really do want to keep open, if at all possible, and particularly schools and obviously other essential services. However, there are a couple of other considerations, and one is that, as Chris Whitty has said, this is going to be the long haul. It's going to take at least six months until we have some vaccine available. So it has to be something which is sustainable. And it's important not to put in place something that you then have to roll back on and then have a recurring cycle. And a third consideration is that the messaging has to be as simple as possible, which then gets you into situations like the rule of six or something like that. And you say, well, is it six? Is it five? Should it be whatever? Well, there isn't an answer, but you need some sort of a simple method. So with all of those things, I think uh, we're, I do not see that what we're doing is bearing down sufficiently on those settings where transmission occurs. Many of us are a bit mystified 
as to the 10 o'clock tur curfew. We can see that if you have people staying all night, they're more likely to get too much to drink, to be close together, it will reduce it in some way. But um, as one children's author said on Twitter the other day, this is coronavirus, it's not Dracula, it comes out in the day. Um, he used an expletive as well, but that's by the by. And I think that seems to be, I think, a, a little bit illogical. And that's why I think you look to Scotland, where they are going somewhat further in that. And, and that, I think, seems to be pretty logical. The other reason why I've got some cause for concern is that what is being proposed is, to some extent, are quite similar to what's already happening in Bolton and Leicester and some other places. And that is not bringing the rates down anything like as much as we would like. So from a theoretical, conceptual point of view, I think there are problems from an empirical point of view, looking at Bolton and Leicester and elsewhere, I think we have problems and I think we would like to go further, recognizing it has to be something that ensures public acceptance and is sustainable in the long term. No, thank you very, very much. And, and in that context, of course, uh, we look across to, to Italy and notice that they seem to not be going through this uh, beginning of a second spike and I, I wonder if, uh, Professor Vinace, is there something you'd like to, to add? I mean, why is Italy not going through what it looks like we are going through? Is there any comparisons we can draw there? What have they done that we haven't? Uh, yes, I don't think it is easy to, to answer to your question. Um, I think that uh, there are uh, at least the two reasons why uh, we are doing better, and I hope we will <laughs> continue doing better. Uh, one is uh, because we have a good uh, um, contact tracing system, which has been set up in different regions, um, and it seems to work. But it works uh, uh, as much as uh, uh, the number of cases is small. Uh, uh, for example, it has been quite effective, I believe, um, uh, in dealing with people coming back from vacation. Um, which was a problem in August, uh, and uh, we have been able to, to screen these people, and uh, uh, I think it was effective in uh, uh, reducing the spread of, of the epidemic. Uh, the second uh, um, issue, I believe, uh, is that, uh, believing or not, <laughs> uh, the Italian population has been complying. Uh, I, I mean, I, I'm a little ironic because uh, people usually think that uh, Italians do not comply with regulations. But in fact, if you go around, uh, I, I've gone around uh, in, uh, in all of Italy in this period because I travel for work and uh, um, everywhere you, you go, uh, you find people uh, wearing masks uh, and uh, people are quite uh, attentive. So uh, for some reason, I believe that the government has been able to convey the message that uh, you have to be very careful. Though there are some subgroups in the population that do not comply, um, particularly the, the young people, uh, you, you, you still see um, large crowds of young people in uh, around, but usually they, they meet outside. And this is another uh, problem that is uh, uh, weather in Italy is, is fine in this period. Uh, and uh, most of the people uh, meet outside. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, as Martin was saying, uh, the risk of uh, uh, getting the disease uh, in, in, in buildings, uh, in, um, in rooms, uh, is much greater than, than outside. So uh, it, it is possible that the situation will change uh, uh, with the, the bad season. Yeah. Then, well, if you like, I can, I can show a couple of slides, but maybe it is premature, about uh, the effect of, of the lockdown. Um, if it, 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 as you as you wish, I'm not sure we've got the capability to to share the screen. Um, perhaps the secretariat can liaise with you. Uh, uh, I can try. Uh, I, I can try briefly. If I cannot, uh, uh, I, I will drop it. Oh. Uh, no, I am disabled. So sure. okay. Okay. That's well, it problem. might be useful if you send those in to us. We'd we'd look at that as as secondary evidence. That would be very interesting. Yes. And, yes. and just coming back to Professor McKee on, on the similar theme. I mean, we're also seeing other countries that seem not to be uh, having the second spike. Uh, and you know, there's uh, Sweden being a very interesting case. Of course, there's lots of talk about what Sweden has and hasn't done. Um, is there anything that we can infer and draw from those countries that seem to not be in this position right now? Because Sweden's got a very similar climate to us, um, and so it's not 
the climate there that's going to be the, the, the main difference. Is there anything that we can learn at this point from what they're doing differently that seems to be leading to a different outcome? Yes, well, the, you might detect in my face a sense of despair when I hear Sweden mentioned yet again. At uh, an independent stage, we will be putting out a briefing document this week, which looks in detail at why uh, the example of Sweden is not, rele not particularly relevant to the United Kingdom, and why there is an awful lot being said about it that is actually factually wrong. And in fact, they are experiencing a, a recurrence of cases in the last few days. So there are a lot of problems with Sweden. And just maybe to... to without getting into detail, because we have written a several page paper, I was just working on it this morning. Uh, essentially, all of the Nordic countries have done well. And the Nordic countries have done well in lots of ways. It's not just in their response to the coronavirus work that I did previously. A lot of my research in the you know, 10 years ago was on the impact of the global financial crisis. And you could see that whenever they were experiencing job, when, when most countries, when they experience job losses, also see a rise in suicides and then a decline as the job losses fall off. The Nordic countries were able to break that connection. They've got very strong institutions, strong welfare state, a much higher level of trust among the population. 68% um, say you, should, you can trust other people, 40% in the UK. Um, and there are a whole series of social factors that mean that you're not comparing like with like. That said, Sweden has done much worse than its neighbors. Um, people often say, well, Denmark and Norway are doing a little bit worse at the minute. True. But then they opened up to a greater extent than Sweden did. Sweden partially closed down and has stayed partially closed down, whereas Sweden and uh, Norway and Denmark have begun to open up and they've seen a bit of an increase. Finland has not, and Finland has never mentioned. So I think one of the things we see is that one of the major factors was how well prepared countries were when they went into this crisis. Some were much better prepared than others. And in the Italian situation, as always with Italy, with its 20 regions, we have a fascinating natural experiment. It was a country that was able to essentially limit the pandemic in the initial way to the northern regions, to uh, Veneto, Emilia, Romagna, Lombardy and uh, Val d'Aosta. And actually, there were interesting comparisons between Lombardy, which did badly, and Veneto, which did relatively well. And that, which we've published a paper on, uh, was to do with having a comprehensive strategy in Veneto, whereas much more of a laissez-faire situation in, in Lombardy. And I think uh, that generally points to the importance of having a clear view about what to do and making sure you have all the levers of command there, which Giuseppe Conte does have. He is effectively ruling by decree. There was a decree in Spain with Pedro Sanchez, but that has now expired. And there are lots of tensions between the Spanish regions and the centre. Uh, which create problems there, which is one of the reasons. And it has not got its contact tracing system up working well, whereas Italy has a long and very, very good tradition of public health. In fact, going right back to the 1950s and the eradication of malaria and the mezzogiorno and so on. And that has continued. So I, I've talked enough, but uh, we can go on. Yeah, no, just just a quick follow up and then I'll throw it to, to Barbara Keeley. I mean, when you say levers of command, what exactly do you mean by by that? Well, the government in Rome was able to do things in a country that is, I mean, so we have to be careful about that national stereotypes. And Paola has already said, in fact, when you look at the face covering wearing, Italy was really far ahead of other countries. People were complying to survey data that Imperial and others have done. Uh, and and uh, you know, people talk about Italy being a difficult country to manage. Uh, but in fact, there has been quite a high level of coordination among the regions, which is not the case so much in Spain. Thank you very much. Barbara Keeley. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Leila. Um, Professor McKee, in terms of how and when we respond to COVID-19, what differences were there between approaches taken in different countries and to what extent do these explain the different outcomes? I mean, you've started talking us through that, perhaps if you can just widen widen it to other countries. And I, I think our primary interest is, what could the UK have learned early in the pandemic to adjust our approach? Because clearly we could look at Italy and other countries and we yeah. could learn. So um, what could we have learned? I think there are three broad factors that have shaped how countries have uh, reacted. I should say we have a paper coming out in the Lancet in a few days' time, which looks at Asian and European countries, which deal with a number of these things. But essentially, the three areas are in the politics and policy, in the science and in the organizational capacity. So there are issues around having the political levers, having the 
the system of government having the institutions in place. And if they're strong and if they're working well and if people are talking to one another, that clearly helps a lot. And of course, we have had a tradition. And I, I mean, I don't want to sort of characterize it too, but there has been a tradition in the, in the UK for a, a decade or so whenever faced with a complex problem of going to one of the large outsourcing companies, be it G4S for the Olympic security or whatever. Now, the Institute for Government have written about this and catalogued problem after problem. And so we haven't got that. We've been cutting the headcount in the civil service. So there's been a problem with our the, the system of government, all the stuff that Peter Hennessy has written about in the past, you know, and, and, and so on. Um, so there, and, and the ability to develop a coherent policy. Some countries have been much, much better, Germany, for example, at doing that. Uh, linked to that, there also has been a sort of paradigm of the, as, and Jeremy Hunt has talked about this, the SARS countries who came into this with their frame of reference being SARS and MERS and so on. And they had a lot of preparation and that was how they looked at it but compared to the influenza countries which had a different view, and this is much more like a SARS type virus. So that, I think that narrative, that paradigm, that frame of thinking was quite important. And just the ability to work across different bits of government. Then we have the science, and that's actually rather more nuanced because obviously it's good if you've got a lot of scientific advice, but sometimes maybe, and it just may be a bit heretical for a researcher to say it, sometimes maybe you can have a little bit too much. And there is a danger that we abandon the precautionary principle and we say, well, we need to have five meta-analyses before we do something. And I think we've seen quite a lot of that in the UK of hesitancy to do things, even though if they brought different disciplines together and said, we may not have a randomized control trial, but we have a lot of evidence in different places and it's all pointing the same direction. Um, obviously, there are countries that have done very badly, Bolsonaro in Brazil, Trump in the United States, that have completely uh, rejected the, the scientific approach. So science is the second. And then the organizational capacity, the ability to respond. Germany with its laboratories, not needing to worry about its health service being uh, overflowing because it has so much capacity. My German colleagues always say they had too much, but uh, they didn't have to worry about running out of intensive care units. But as, as important, I think, the knowledge that you have got that capacity, almost like an insurance, gives you that freedom to make other decisions. And if you feel that you've got a system that if you get it wrong, it's going to be overwhelmed, or if there are things you would like to do, like the testing, but you know you can't, or if you don't have confidence in the public health system, as I think was the case here, then you have, uh, you, you're constrained in what you can do. So I think to try and generalize, but I can go into individual countries very easily if you want, but to generalize, I think policy, policy politics, um, science and knowledge and evidence and organizational capacity explain quite a bit. And of course, in the initial way, but less so now, luck, where the cases came in from. So Lombardy was affected particularly because of the, the, the clothing, the uh, fashion industry and so on, a lot of links with China, a lot of movement coming in and out. People then went, and we've published a paper on as well, looking at the um, Bergamo at Atalanta. I, I'm not into football particularly, but I learned quite a lot reading that paper. But the Bergamo-Valencia match, which does seem to have spread it, and then Spanish cases coming to the UK. Um, Brazil was infected from Italy too. So there was an element of serendipity as to where people went. And as, as my follow-on question was, um, what could the UK have learned early in the pandemic to adjust our approach? I mean, it's, that, that's that, that's very broad brush, and we, we do look yeah. forward to the paper you're going to publish. But it, you know, I, 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 can you point to things that we could have learned uh, early in the pandemic? And I'm, uh, also, we could ask uh, Professor Vinay's um, what has been learned in Italy, because lessons learned are clearly very important at this point. Well, yeah. I think we could have learned a lot more from Italy, and there were conversations. I'm, I'm, I'm aware of them because I, I speak to my Italian colleagues, uh, and it was primarily through the G7 mechanism because, of course, we were not engaging through the EU. But in the G7, you did have Germany, France, and Italy, although France was not present in one of the, the, the key meetings. Uh, but I think we didn't do anything like enough there, and I think we could have learned particularly about the role of the public health at the USLs at the local level in Italy. That would have been very helpful. And to also look at the differences between Veneto and Lombardy, which Italian colleagues were, were doing. Now, that did feed in, but I'm, I'm aware of the timing of it. It fed in, unfortunately, rather too late. Um, 
and we, we obviously should have reacted early. But I think our, I think one of the things that concerns me a lot, and I am a professor of European public health, so I would say this, is that um, without getting into the other political issues, our connections with the rest, I should also declare that I'm also an advisor to the regional director of WHO for Europe. Um, our connections, with, which are often informal with our colleagues in the rest of Europe, there are some individual ones, people in Public Health England do talk to individuals in Robert Koch, but they're nothing like as good as they were in the past. I think they should be. Okay, thank you. And Pro Professor Vinay, what lessons do you think have been learned in Italy since the first wave? Yeah, um, I think that there are two aspects. Uh, um, one has been already uh, mentioned by, by Martin, and it is, uh, uh, say, the difference between Lombardy and Veneto, which means uh, uh, that uh, Lombardy mainly um, used uh, the hospital system, uh, meaning that uh, um, serious, uh, seriously ill patients uh, were sent to the hospital and uh, the, the, the spread of the epidemic uh, um, occurred through hospitals. And also there was a, a huge spread uh, through um, uh, nursing homes, uh, as we know. Um, whereas in, in Veneto and other regions, which have a stronger uh, public health uh, and uh, um, network of GPs, uh, um, patients were treated at home uh, and there was not uh, a, um, uh, a crowd of patients uh, in hospitals. Uh, um, uh, and also treatment was earlier and, and more effective. Uh, so lethality was lower in, in, in Veneto. Uh, the sec well, by the way, uh, the, the lesson of this experience uh, uh, means that, uh, for example, in the region where I live, uh, which is uh, uh, Piemonte, uh, we have reinforced uh, uh, the uh, general practitioners uh, network. Uh, and now general practitioners uh, uh, have received uh, additional funding and they uh, collaborate with uh, the public health, uh, uh, the public health system. So there is a, a kind of, uh, um, uh, there are guidelines uh, um, that allow uh, general practitioners to take care of uh, uh, suspect uh, uh, COVID patients uh, and then um, the, the public health uh, services uh, um, uh, that they cover and that they prescribe uh, uh, swabs uh, and so on. So there is a, a line of, um, uh, of action which, uh, um, which means that uh, the whole system is much more effective compared to the first uh, phase, which might explain why we have fewer cases now. Mm -hmm. The second uh, thing I want to, uh, to stress is that uh, uh, the timeliness of lockdown was really crucial. And in fact, I, I, we have very good uh, um, evidence uh, that I can share with you later um, uh, about the fact uh, that uh, um, southern regions uh, were essentially spared by, by COVID uh, because uh, the lockdown was introduced on, on March uh, uh, the 11th uh, when uh, the, there had been no spread to southern regions or, or very little. Whereas uh, um, northern regions uh, uh, performed uh, uh, much worse, uh, first because uh, uh, COVID started in northern regions, uh, Veneto and, and Lombardy, and second because the lockdown was relatively late uh, uh, compared to the uh, start of the epidemic. And well, I, I have a very nice graph showing that as soon as uh, uh, the lockdown was introduced and mobility was uh, stopped, um, uh, uh, RT went down uh, immediately uh, uh, below one. So, um, uh, yeah, I think that uh, these are two important lessons for the future. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So just a, a quick follow up on, on that. I mean, uh, there was a, a talk of having a mini lockdown in the UK and that was being discussed. Uh, and it turns out that the government has not adopted that option. I mean, based on the evidence that, that you're describing there, are you suggesting that that is the more prudent approach that the UK should have taken right now, Professor Vinay? Uh, well, I <laughs> unfortunately uh, the discussion is about uh, lockdown or no lockdown. It's it's a pity that uh, no other solutions have been tested and discussed because uh, uh, I think that there have been experiments uh, um, with using, for example, uh, GPS and studying the movements of people. Uh, showing that uh, there might be um, intermediate solutions. Uh, I, I think that something intermediate between uh, uh, closing everybody at home or uh, doing little um, business as usual 
uh, can be explored uh, uh, a little more. Uh, but I, I think that Martin agrees. Uh, uh, we need a kind of experiments. Uh, uh, for example, comparing. I'm a little surprised that uh, very few people did experiments about schools, like uh, uh, testing the effectiveness of uh, different uh, um, ways of containing the, the epidemic. Um, even with uh, randomized trials, uh, um, doing serology in, uh, in children and in teachers. So I'm not sure that uh, the lockdown is, uh, uh, is the only solution when the situation becomes serious. Um, certainly it was very effective in, in, uh, in the first phase, uh, but we lacked uh, uh, scientific research, uh, well planned, well designed uh, to uh, look for uh, intermediate solutions, and I well, in any case, uh, the the uh, uh, um, one alternative is to have a, a, a local uh, lockdown, so like uh, uh, closing down uh, uh, towns or, or even uh, certain areas in in big cities, if if possible, the the so-called red zones, which in fact uh, is effective in certain cases. Thank you very much, um, Lord Russell. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, I think it, it's clear from the evidence that um, of what was happening in Italy that in the, the first phase, um, we were not listening and did not learn and reacted uh, too late. Given that we are now, uh, as predicted, um, uh, on, the, on the cusp of a, a second wave or on the verge of it, uh, and that is happening in, in other countries, in, in your view, and this is for Martin first, ha have, have we learned enough from the first phase to be smarter about how we are managing the second phase? Um, and if not, what should we be doing? Oh, it's a very good question because I'm not privy to the discussions that are taking place within government, obviously. Uh, we have in the European Observatory created a COVID response monitor. We have a network of correspondents from um, about 25, 30 countries or so, and we update it every day, in fact, with not just uh, reports of what's what each country is doing, but we've done a number of cross-cutting thematic analyses, um, but we've just got one that we're, we've, we've just paper, had a paper accepted on testing. I, I fear that we have not... Uh, there still is a degree of exceptionalism here. And I worry that, although, as I mentioned, there are individuals who have got links elsewhere. We do not have that depth and breadth. Um, I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, in the old days, uh, people in uh, senior civil servants in the Department of Health would have had the, the mobile phone numbers of their correspondents across Europe. Um, I do, but they don't at the minute. Uh, they don't seem to have any way. And, and my colleagues in other European countries, from ministers, state secretaries and others, are saying, well, we're not having those discussions. There's a little bit, but it doesn't seem to be anything like as much as it might be, unfortunately. Okay. And Paolo, could, could I ask you, I mean, Italy at the moment, and I speak from uh, southeastern Sardinia at the moment, <laughs> um, where I am incredibly impressed, the contrast with London in degree of the individual compliance and behaviours of the average citizen is, is stark. But Paolo, given that there is, I, I would imagine, a possibility that Italy, in su to some degree, may experience forms of a second wave, what has Italy learned from the first wave and how will that impact how it responds should there be a second wave? Uh, yes, I, I think that uh, there has been a broad discussion about uh, the limitations of the response uh, in the first wave. Um, uh, for example, uh, supply of uh, uh, devices, uh, PPEs uh, uh, and, and, and also reagents for swabs. Uh, there has been a, um, a response uh, at the governmental uh, level, uh, for example, in terms of supplies. And, and now for, um, they, they plan to have up to uh, 200,000 uh, uh, swaps per day if uh, the situation becomes uh, critical. Uh, so this was probably the first uh, um, response. Uh, uh, the second uh, is... Uh, um, what I, I, I mentioned before, uh, it, some kind of reorganization of uh, uh, the um, response uh, locally uh, in single regions. Uh, 
um, through an empowerment of, uh, of uh, general practitioners uh, and uh, of the public health services. So now, now there are guidelines uh, and uh, um, uh, uh, for example, contact tracing is, is effective, at least in the region where I live, but I, I hear from people living certainly in Veneto, which is probably the best region uh, in dealing with COVID. Uh, I believe in Lazio and uh, uh, other regions. So uh, the contact, trace, uh, uh, contact tracing um, system uh, seems to work uh, up to now. Uh, the problem is uh, whether or not, uh, uh, because of uh, uh, winter, for example, we have a, a, a larger increase in the number of cases. And uh, at that point, uh, um, contact tracing might, might become uh, insufficient or we might have troubles with uh, swabs and reagents. Yeah. We're, we are talking a lot about uh, uh, the use of saliva tests, uh, by the way, uh, which uh, seem to be cheaper and uh, they, they might be uh, quite helpful. Um, and uh, as you say, uh, compliance by the people is, is pretty good, uh, even surprisingly. So um, I hope there will be no second wave. If there is a second wave, uh, uh, we are more prepared than uh, for the first wave uh, uh, because of a uh, centralized supplies uh, system for swabs and uh, uh, because of the system of contact tracing, which, however, um, I have insisted a lot uh, uh, with my regional administration to have uh, stress tests of the system. That is, uh, all right, we have uh, now about... Uh, 60 or 80 cases per day in the region, which is uh, about uh, 5 million people. But uh, what if we have uh, 600? Uh, 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 can, can we deal with uh, uh, such a large number? And, and we should do a stress test to, to, to foresee whether the system uh, uh, will react uh, properly. Thank you. Thank you very much. Martin, could I just ask a follow-up? You mentioned the you were surprised that there weren't more um, sort of tests done of, of schools in particular to try and see what might happen. Um, if you look at um, what is happening at the moment in schools and universities, are you comfortable that we are prepared in those areas or do you have cause for concern? I have cause for concern. Um, on Independence Age, we did publish a report on universities where we argued for online learning. Now, as, as someone who is involved in this at the minute in converting my course to online teaching. I have no illusions whatsoever about the work involved. It is absolutely enormous. Um, and for a, an hour's lecture, um, it, it's about eight hours work preparation. It's a huge amount of work, but we're doing it. Um, but we, we did say that there were major risks of bringing everybody together. Simple principle, you're mixing people from all over the country. And we frankly, if we think back, some of us think back long enough, we can remember the way students behave. Um, I'll leave it at that. On schools, we also published a report um, where we were uh, calling for considerable caution. And I think we were concerned that over the summer, when there was time to really invest in preparations, trying to get more space, including even marquees or port cabins or whatever, if they could be fitted in. And we have a problem with space, of course, in the UK. We have much bigger class sizes than in many other European countries. So in primary schools, um, again, to look at the, the Scandinavian, the average in the public sector primary schools in the UK is 27, uh, 27.2 or something like that. In, in Sweden, it's about 20. Uh, so we, there, were, there was much more that could have been done that, I don't, that we didn't do. What we were particularly concerned about in, in our report and which has come to fruition was we argued that the guidance from the Department for Education was, frankly, it was incredibly vague. It was, uh, use your own judgment. It was, ask Public Health England. And I heard, and we, we were saying at the time, we actually need to have worked examples. You know, you've got two children that come back infectious. They're in the same family, but from different classes. What do you do? Um, how do you do a sort of, uh, what the army would call a training exercise without troops, that sort of thing. You know, it would be working through the, uh, the procedures and I you know I've been listening to head teachers on, on the Today program and elsewhere saying we've tried to find out we called the public health for four days and we couldn't get an answer we don't know and we felt that those scenarios just a, a number of you know 10 or so common scenarios predictable ones should be worked through 
who do you call? And then the head teachers would know, do I have the right phone number? Do I know who I should be speaking to? What should I be doing? None of that was done. And that was done in other countries, um, as well as a lot of things around what I think head teachers did as far as they could, separating the classes and, and you know, minor building works and so on to the extent that they could. So I think we, we, we wasted a lot of time. And of course, I, I fully understand head teachers also had the problem of the difficulties with the examinations this year. Quite why, if you're using an algorithm, you couldn't have given the children the results in June because you could have predicted it then anyway. You weren't waiting for the marks to come in and then they would have had time to get on. I mean, that's another question which I haven't heard anybody ask. Uh, but it did mean that I think we were much less well prepared mm. and with hesitating to say we told you so. Well, actually, we did in our reports. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you. And uh, on that note of, of people picking up the phone, I mean, I'm, I'm very intrigued, Martin, by uh, what you were saying in terms of the good old days when people would have each other's phone numbers. Yeah. I just want to drill into that just a bit further. I mean, wh how, how, how many years ago was the good old days? When, when did people stop having each other's phone numbers in this country? Uh, actually, it was, I'm trying to think, probably about eight or seven or eight years ago. Uh, you know, in those days, and I've been floating around the European scene for really since 1990. And in those days, and some of you will know, and having been in, in ministerial roles and others, the UK really played a very important role. And our ministers and civil servants, were, there were a lot of things in Europe are done outside the room. So I can remember when we were having the negotiations on the cross-border care directive, the UK, uh, along with um, Denmark and Sweden and a number of other countries, um, were working together. We had a meeting in Sella in Germany, um, which was an informal meeting. It was not you know, just off the record, informal discussions in the same way that there have been more recently on pharmaceutical pricing with the Benelux A countries, a meeting we had in, in Outback in the Austrian Alps, but the UK has not been part of that for quite a long time. And, and they were these informal connections uh, that we have lost. And uh, in fact, we did have two very good senior civil servants in the international division um, up to the, just after the referendum, and they were made redundant, which was a tragedy because they had that collective memory. They knew people, uh, and uh, I'm not criticizing the people who are there now, but a lot of these things are based on, on personal contacts. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful to know. And you spoke about exceptionalism. I mean, what examples of exceptionalism are you seeing that are still occurring now, given that I think we have learned our lesson that we should be looking to other countries? And, and bluntly, has it cost lives? Oh, it's really difficult to say. I'm trying to think of a concrete example, but it's just more generally, you know, not really looking in detail. I mean, some of this debate about Sweden is really interesting, actually. Because if you talk to Swedish colleagues, as I do, um, partly because I've an endless stream of journalists saying, do you know anybody in Sweden who can talk to me? Uh, but leaving that aside, you know, I know Sweden well. It's, it's having the nuanced knowledge of what it's like on the ground. Uh, and I think, you know, often in my job, it is so important to understand the history, the culture of a country, and also to understand that you may have be using the same words, but they're interpreted in a different way. And that just comes with like pattern recognition, comes with practice, it comes with the ancient experience. But, and I think we miss out on that. It's all that soft knowledge. So therefore you take superficial, um, assum make superficial assumptions and you make superficial assumptions, particularly when you're dealing with countries, when the reality of it is you should be looking at regions within countries and recognizing that there is a huge difference between Veneto and uh, some of the regions in the Metzogorna, an enormous difference between Mecklenburg or Pommern in Germany or Baden-Württemberg. Um, you know, all of that sort of thing is, is really important. And I think we, we tend to miss that out by not being engaged in those day-to-day -day discussions. And um, just finally, before I uh, go to Lord Strasburger, um, Paolo, I don't know if you've got a view of this from, from where you sit. I mean, do you uh, recognize this British exceptionalism and uh, what do you uh, notice about it? Um, well, I, I never thought about it, in fact. Um, well, I've been living in, uh, in the UK for 15 years, uh, 16, and uh, um, I, frankly, I don't find uh, so many differences uh, uh, <laughs> at this point. Uh, 
And I'm not sure I, I, I identify a British exceptionalist. I know about the, the American exceptionalism. Uh, not, not so sure about the British one. Um, uh, well, there have been a cultural differences uh, between the UK and, uh, and Italy during COVID. Uh, perhaps uh, uh, Italy is, uh, um, there is much more debate, uh, perhaps uh, people talk uh, in bars or uh, uh, my feeling is that uh, people talk about politics uh, for the good and for the bad more in Italy than, than in the UK. And also uh, people tend to be more emotional in Italy. So you will find uh, uh, a lot of conflicts in the newspapers, for example, but at the end uh, uh, um, we come up with uh, solutions uh, and uh, also uh, in spite of the uh, emotional approach uh, and uh, the conflict uh, and whatever, the political debate, um, people comply. So uh, though there has been a movement against the masks, for example, like uh, as, uh, everywhere, the vast majority of the people use masks. So, well, in, in any case, I, 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 I don't know exactly whether there is a, a British exceptionalism Maybe it showed up uh, in the first phase in the response to, mm -hmm. yes, uh, in the response to, to, the, to COVID. Uh, I must say that in the first uh, few weeks uh, when the, the story of COVID came up, um, Italy uh, was considered as too emotional. Uh, our response was considered uh, to be exaggerated. Uh, and we, we are too focused on the family, we are too emotional, and we shouldn't react like that. But in, in fact, uh, perhaps we, we had the right uh, reaction. So that might be the, the British exception. Of this, Understood. Maybe more cultural than anything yeah. else. A misunderstanding of other cultures. Yes. Exactly. Uh, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Lord Strasburger. Thank you, Leila, and uh, welcome to our two witnesses. I'd like to talk about testing and tracing, which uh, is hardly covering itself in glory in this country at the moment. Um, can you tell us how the approach um, is different in other countries to testing and tracing and uh, how successful it's been? Uh, shall I start with you, uh, Paolo, uh, with respect to Italy, and then perhaps I'll come to Martin on uh, the wider question. Right. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I can say um, how it has been successful uh, uh, lately in the, in the last uh, couple of months, uh, probably, because uh, the first phase uh, was uh, so dramatic uh, that we had to build up the system. And uh, so uh, uh, contact tracing was uh, uh, more successful in the regions that have been already mentioned, like Veneto, where there was a very well structured uh, uh, public health system and uh, a network of uh, general practitioners. So, so it was very clear who was supposed to do what. Um, uh, and uh, also there was a relatively limited uh, uh, um, shortage of supplies. Um, now in the last uh, couple of months, uh, uh, I have followed uh, uh, very closely the situation in Piemonte because I have been involved in the so-called uh, crisis unit uh, in Piemonte. And uh, so I, I've been uh, um, acting as a supervisor for the system of contact tracing. And uh, I think uh, uh, it works uh, so far the, because of, of uh, uh, at least uh, three reasons. Uh, one is uh, because we, we have now national guideline, uh, guidelines and also uh, regional guidelines on contact tracing. So it, it is, rather clear what uh, needs to be done. The second is, is because we have reinforced uh, the uh, uh, general practitioners uh, uh, network uh, and uh, we have uh, specified much better like Veneto what uh, uh, people are supposed to do, uh, both the general practitioners and the public health services uh, in terms of identifying the cases uh, and uh, uh, then their contacts and uh, uh, performing swabs uh, uh, in the context. And, and, and in this case, uh, um, avoiding um, the, the spread of outbreaks because the, 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 the goal obviously is to stop uh, outbreaks. Um, 
And uh, I think this has, has been working. Uh, and the third reason uh, is because we have a centralized uh, system for um, uh, um, providing um, reagents. Uh, and uh, uh, so th there is no shortage at, at this point in time. I'm concerned about a potential second wave because I'm not sure, as I said, we need a, a stress mm -hmm. test. Uh, we, we, we need to be sure that uh, the current organization will work. And uh, by the way, in, uh, this Friday, I have a meeting uh, with other people just to discuss this, uh, the future of the uh, uh, contact tracing system in, in, Pied in Piemonte if there is uh, a second uh, wave. You, you've, you've pointed out that the acquisition of uh, reagents is handled centrally, but the rest of your answer implied that the control of actually delivering the testing and tracing services is at a more local level than it is in this country. Is that correct? Yes, 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 yes. The delivery of, uh, uh, of tests uh, is done uh, locally. Uh, well, it depends on, uh, um, uh, on the um, public health uh, system in each uh, region. And uh, uh, so contact tracing is organized uh, regionally. And that, that is a factor in the success, is it? Uh, well, I think so, because there is uh, more control. Uh, you have more uh, opportunities of uh, um, uh, checking what is going on and, and what are the troubles uh, arising. Okay. And, uh, because, we, as you know, we have uh, uh, local health units uh, within each of the regions, uh, and uh, um, each of them has its own uh, public health uh, service. Uh, and uh, so you can uh, check uh, in which uh, uh, local health units uh, contact tracing is not working. Uh, and uh, in principle, the uh, administration, uh, like the, uh, um, uh, the Department of Health uh, uh, in, in the region, can take measures uh, if uh, they notice that something is, is not working. And we have obviously a, a, an epidemiological uh, a regular survey uh, of the of the cases uh, arising. Uh, I know every day how many cases uh, arise, how many deaths, uh, by local health unit, by uh, municipality, by region. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Martin. Could you answer the same question? And yeah. Can you tell us where in Europe testing and tracing is going best? Okay, um, well, I'm not sure I've got a comparative measure. I can tell you where it's going better and where it's going worse, perhaps. Uh, but I think there are two broad approaches, one of which is that you have, um, when cases are identified, somebody calls them and tells them to identify their contacts and to isolate and sort of leaves it at that. And that's the model we have here. And it's rather similar in Spain and in France. In many other countries, it is very much at a local level, as in Italy and the USL, the local health unit. Uh, it is this shoe leather epidemiology where when you get a case, you don't just tell the contacts to isolate, you follow up the contacts, ideally with testing, and you follow back to work out where they got the infection. Because with this disease, we know that an awful lot of the transmission is in what we call super spreading events in churches or in um, nightclubs and, and that and fact, like in Germany and the meatpacking plant in Gutersloh uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there's much more of a sort of detective work. Now, I've said elsewhere, the model that we have is a little bit like bringing in Miss Markle or Father Brown and locking them in a room and telling them to investigate the murder by phone, um, whereas the other countries actually set them out in Kemblefort or wherever and, uh, and ask them to go out and walk around and, and see what's happening. Uh, now, of course, in the UK, the local public health departments in local government are now doing that and they're having some success. But of course, there have been huge problems in getting the data, the information flows and so on. So I think that's one prob fundamental problem. Before I answer who's doing well, well, maybe I'll, so who's doing well? Well, I think Germany is clearly uh, doing well. Italy is doing well. The Central European countries in general have doing well, been doing well. And, and this is something where a number of us some of us were very heavily involved in the uh, post-Soviet transition in the region, in my case, particularly in both in Czechoslovakia and Hungary and to some extent Poland and, and Romania. And we were rather critical of these public health, uh, sanitary epidemiological centers that were a bit obsolete and we wanted what they were doing. But actually, 
uh, you know, they've now come into their own. It's not to say that they, they couldn't do better, but having that local presence. But I want to pick up on one point which we haven't talked about, and that is procurement. And the reason I'm saying that is I'm the rapporteur. I'm on the European Commission's expert panel on investing in health. Um, I have an Irish passport as well, hence my ability to remain there. And um, I'm the rapporteur on uh, a report on procurement in health. And we're looking at the whole spectrum, but one of the bits is pandemic planning. And what has become clear is that as I was writing it, I was very conscious of the need to make sure that not all of the examples of failures came from the United Kingdom, because it would have been quite easy to have done that. Other countries have had failures too, problems with corruption in a number of countries, problems with lack of due diligence, problems with shell companies being set up uh, where, where they've only had an existence of a few weeks and no due diligence was done. But in terms of the, the league table, the UK is definitely out in the forefront there in terms of the lack of transparency, the failures that have occurred uh, and so on and so forth. So I think that's something that really does need attention. I'm hoping our report should be out at the end of the month. Um, as I say, there have been problems elsewhere. Belgium, Germany, France, almost everywhere has had some problems, but we've just had an awful lot and we keep, seem to be continuing to do it. So you seem to be arguing in, in favour of more transparency on procurement, yeah. more local control, and a, a more proactive follow-up to cases. That's, yeah. that's what you're saying. Well, in fact, we should be doing the procurement. I mean, we are still subject to the European regulations on procurement until the 31st of December. Uh, so the transfer, I mean, there are, there is a there mechanism by the yeah, but we're just not we're not complying with it. I mean, there is, as you know, ongoing legal proceedings uh, which is looking at this, uh, and it'll be interesting to see what that comes up with. But given that it is coming up, I probably should say no more. Thank you very much. Back to you, Lola. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Philippa Whitford, uh, who's on mute. You're mute fortunately. Classic Zoom mistake. Uh, hello there. Um, if Hi, I could come to Martin first, I know we don't really have very long, but as we're going into this new upsurge, obviously we had announcement of new restrictions across the four nations in the UK yesterday. Um, a lot of them are pretty much the same, um, but some differences. Probably the biggest difference is around the rules around households. Yeah. Now, our test and trace has shown that in the West of Scotland, it is households interacting um, that is driving our current outbreak there. So the Scottish and indeed Welsh and Northern Ireland are about no household mixing at all. In England, there's still the rule of six. Do you think England is being too generous or are we being too draconian at this point? Well, I think um, we, I think England is being too generous actually. I, I'm, I have no I'm not privy to the discussions around the cabinet table, but I would be surprised if the advice given to ministers in the four nations was much different. Uh, but uh, these are ultimately political decisions because as you said, that's where the mixing is occurring. And uh, we've, we've seen that uh, in the area parts of England that have been locked down where you're still allowing some movement and, and it's not suppressing it. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether the other witnesses have any comment from uh, their experience in Italy or elsewhere, whether the, they think households is the main thing driving this? Um, um, we, well, um, from evidence we have about uh, the first wave, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the main driver has been uh, mobility uh, by far. So, uh, but the situation has changed, uh, obviously. Uh, the, the first wave, uh, the, the start of the first wave uh, was uh, strongly related to mobility. And, and as soon as mobility was reduced uh, through the lockdown, the RT went down dramatically. But, um, now the situation is, is different because, uh, um, um, well, students uh, have uh, uh, restarted going to school. Um, so probably the households uh, are becoming more important. Uh, um, also, um, there has been a, we can say that a depletion of the more susceptible, uh, a lot of the cases were in uh, uh, nursing homes, uh, and uh, now there is much more control uh, over nursing homes uh, uh, through testing. So, uh, yes, it, it is possible that uh, households uh, are becoming one of the centers. Uh, I, I've been a little surprised that uh, um, 
uh, the professional occupational uh, environment uh, has not been uh, uh, that important uh, in the first wave uh, and, e and neither in the second wave, uh, because we, we haven't had uh, big outbreaks uh, in uh, industrial settings. Uh, uh, now, my, my concern is about uh, school and transportation. Students are going, going to school by bus and uh, taken the, the virus uh, home. Okay, just on I mean, that, I in the it's... devolved nations, we still had the advice to work from home. And part of that is, is the workspace, but it's also the travel. Um, yes, yes. Whereas it's only a few weeks since in England, people were encouraged to go back to offices and now that has ended. Do you think that plays much of a part, you know, by just increasing the demand on public transport? Oh, yes, 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 I'm sure. Uh, well, once again, it depends very much on how uh, public transport will be managed, because, uh, for example, I don't know in England, but uh, I've been living in, in Italy since March because of the lockdown, uh, but I travel by train and occasionally by bus, and uh, um, there are rules. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in train, uh, you can occupy only... Um, uh, only certain seats, uh, uh, not all of the seats, uh, about 50%. Uh, so th they have implemented rules uh, uh, on trains uh, and uh, also on buses uh, in terms of uh, social distancing. So uh, transportation is uh, key, but uh, uh, it might not be dramatic as it was in the first phase. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, thank you both. Uh, we are technically uh, over the end of the session, but I have one final question and also an opportunity for, for you to uh, feed back. I mean, we are now at the beginning of uh, what looks like a, a big uptake, a potential second wave that we have been fearing for, for so long. Um, the purpose of our inquiries um, is to help this country prepare. And so my question at the end is, is very simple. I mean, what would you be advising government should be its top priority right now to help to dampen down what we are seeing in the uptick in cases? Perhaps I'll start with Paolo and then come to, to Martin to finish us off. Uh, yes, uh, this is the same advice I will be, I will give a Friday in the meeting I, I'm going to, that is, uh, um, we need uh, absolutely to uh, be sure that uh, we stop the outbreaks uh, uh, as soon as, as they appear, which means that uh, we, we have to be sure that the contact tracing system works. Uh, I think this, this is the first uh, priority. Second priority, well, I would uh, um, keep on uh, implementing the current uh, measures of uh, uh, social distancing, so, but, 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 distancing, but that, that's uh, obvious. Thank you very much. And uh, Martin? I totally agree. We need a, what we've talked about is a find, test, trace, isolate and support with an emphasis on all of them. And beyond that, we need a strategy. We need a joined up strategy where there's clear lines of accountability, clear lines of data flow. And we haven't had that. In our very first Independent Sage report, um, we did a bit of drawing on work I've done with immunization programs and with cancer screening programs using systems analysis, where you look at all the bits that need to come together and how they link up. And if you don't get them right, and in many countries in immunization and cancer screening, we haven't got them right. You need the whole thing to come together. And that's what we should have done at the very beginning. And that's what we said in our first report. Brilliant. Well, thank you both so much uh, for your time. It's been a really fascinating session. And I think it set us up very nicely for part two, uh, which is going to be focusing in on uh, communication. Uh, and uh, behavioral uh, science in the wider public. So I thank you both for being here. You're very welcome to stay, but we also ah, appreciate no. you are very, very busy people and we will not be offended if you have to go off and do something else. Um, but thank you again. Thank you, uh, Martin, in particular, for the second time coming back thank to you. us. We really appreciate that. And thank you, Paolo. Uh, really, really appreciate your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. much. We'll thank now you. take a just very quick uh, break. Um, whilst we make sure that everyone is set up and we will start the, the second session. So let's just give it one second. And make sure everyone's happy. Right. We will begin if that's all right. So thank you all. So we now move to the second session. Uh, thank you um, all three of you for your patience. I hope you found that as interesting as we did. There's a lot that I think tumbles into your lines of, of expertise. Um, and uh, again, we have three very eminent 
uh, witnesses in front of us. And I, I thank you for your time. We have Professor Luca Richeldi, uh, Professor of Respiratory Medicine and Honorary Consultant at Southampton University. Uh, Professor Richeldi maintains strong links with medical colleagues in Modena, where he founded the Center for Rare Lung Diseases and is an Associate Professor of Respiratory Medicine. Um, and he'll be speaking to us about the differences between how different countries have responded to COVID-19, uh, again, with different outcomes. Um, Professor Sergio Bonini, thank you for coming, uh, is the Professor of Internal Medicine and Research Associate at the Italian National uh, Research Council, Institute of Translational Pharmacology in Rome. Uh, on the basis of public clinical research on COVID-19, Professor Bonini will be discussing how scientific evidence should guide government's recommendations, um, but also how these should be influenced by the quality of the evidence, the relevance of the expected effort, and the economic cost of the political choices for the individual and the community. Very, very apt uh, in this week's news. And uh, last but not least, um, Professor Dinan Pillai, a uh, professor of virology at UCL, uh, Professor Pillai, will be discussing the evidence uh, regarding action taken on drugs and vaccines, um, and will be um, coming to you particularly in the in the latter third, where we'll be focusing and drilling down on on the vaccine that's meant to save us all. And there are that we understand there's lots of research going on, um, and we've got specific questions uh, around that. So thank you all three of you for your time. Um, so I'd like to start by asking. Um, how well is the UK doing? And this is, you know, uh, at this point where we are looking at uh, the second wave on its way. Um, and in particular, uh, hearing from uh, Paolo Venez just now about the three prongs, the first being communication. Uh, I would love to hear uh, from all three of you just initially, what is your personal assessment of how the UK is doing right now? Um, perhaps I'll start with Professor Rikeldi. Laila, thank you very much. First, let, let, let me tell you that unfortunately I'm not in the UK anymore because in 2016, uh, as a byproduct of Brexit probably, I come back to Rome. So I'm now in Rome. I'm the head of respiratory at the Catholic University in Rome. And, and I'm part of the strategic committee for coronavirus for the Italian government. So I've been uh, working in Rome since 2000. But I've been in Southampton for four years. So thank you, thank you for clarifying that. I appreciate it. Our loss. Yeah. So how the UK is doing? I, I've been in contact with a lot of a lot with colleagues in the UK, of course, because I'm still honorary professor in Southampton. And honestly, if I have to give you my honest uh, opinion of what was the reaction of the UK uh, to the coronavirus pandemic, I was really shocked. Because in days when in Italy we were living a collective tragedy, a real tragedy, I mean, we were having uh, military trucks full of coffins uh, in the north of Italy, in the most economically developed part of Italy, with one of the best healthcare services in Europe. And still, we were seeing in the television uh, images that usually you see in wars. So that was really a shocking moment for the country. And I think that's one of the key for the reason why now we have less cases than other countries. It was an emotional shock in the country. In those same days, in the UK actually, there was basically very little or no reaction. And the discussion was around uh, having closing the pubs or not, or having maybe one member of your strategic committee maybe being cuffed when we was leaving home during the lockdown. So I was I had the impression that in general uh, what was happening in Italy was not really perceived as something that could happen in the UK. That was my impression. Now, as a consequence of what happened in Italy, I think uh, Italy took extreme measures, like closing every school in the country and not reopening them. So the schools reopened on 14th of September, but only with the daily distribution of 11 million of masks to every scholar, every day. Uh, with strict social distancing in the classes, with very strict protocol for 
quarantine uh, classes if something will happen in those classes. Uh, in the same reason, you know, there are being uh, activities that Italians love very much. Uh, we have been discussing soccer, still closed, uh, or mass, uh, still uh, with strict protocols. Um, and I think that this, together with what Professor Vinay was telling us, with a little bit of tradition, of the public healthcare system in uh, contact tracing for infectious disease, which is still very active. And I think that more or less with difference across regions, of course, but I will, I will see those reasons as the reason for uh, the current epidemiological situation. Now consider that the average, the average Italian people is very concerned by the actual situation in Italy. And uh, because we have been seeing a steady increase, linear, not uh, exponential, in the number of people admitted to the hospital. Last element, I think, uh, we, uh, the shock was emotional because um, elderly people were affected. So the average age of people dying in the first wave was eight years old. Now that part of the Italian family is a very crucial important part. And I can tell you that the shock of the families of not being able to be close to their loved ones in the moment they die. So I have been seeing in my hospital, all of these people dying alone which is something really that, again, shock emotionally people. So now, I think uh, with differences, with some uh, exception, of course, but even the younger generation has a little bit of responsibility for protecting the early people that live at home. So that's, I think, is one of the reasons why we see there is a relatively widespread use of masks or social distancing and people do not complain really a lot about it. We, we didn't have any big march against masks. That didn't happen. Because they would, they, that, it doesn't make sense if you experience what happened in Italy in March. So that's, I think, I think how we see the situation now. Thank you very much. Um, and going to you, Professor Bonini, with the same question and from your perspective, what's your view of how the UK has been handling this so far? Uh, well, uh, the numbers uh, tell us that the uh, uh, UK at the moment is not doing very well for the number of infected people and deaths. Uh, so the question is uh, whether uh, the measures uh, that uh, were implemented by the government uh, just recently uh, uh, will be able uh, to change the situation and to make it more similar, for example, to Italy. I think is uh, uh, that the answer uh, uh, will not come only from what kind of measures, but it will be very important uh, the compliance of people uh, to this measure. Uh, why the compliance was so high in Italy? Uh, we discussed during the first session uh, that we were surprised to see such a high compliance. Uh, there are several reasons. One uh, has been suggested to be the age of uh, people. Um, from data uh, which come uh, from uh, uh, the observatory, the initiative about uh, health, uh, uh, which was mentioned by Martin McKee, the number of people over 60, over 70, and over 80 in Italy is definitely higher than the number of people in UK. Uh, so it, it was expected that these people uh, uh, who represent a vulnerable population uh, could have uh, been more compliant to rules. However, uh, surprisingly, a study which comes from uh, the University of Edinburgh, uh, the author is uh, Jean-Francois Dost, uh, studying on 27 countries, the study was published in Plus One, and uh, 
they found, and the data are data which come from the Imperial College and the YouGov data set. They realized that, uh, in fact, uh, people over 70 were, were not more responsive uh, to uh, um, uh, measures uh, than people uh, in the 50s or in the 60s. So this is, uh, uh, but age could be important. And in fact, also this author found that there is, uh, uh, the, imply, the compliance is increasing with age. Uh, the problem uh, with the second uh, uh, phase in Italy where young people uh, were after the lockout lockdown with the reopening of discos, uh, uh, they uh, created more uh, infection and transmission. Another problem uh, is the risk perception. Uh, Professor Ricchelli has mentioned uh, the number of co coffins. Uh, all these images uh, were, uh, are still in our eyes. So a transparent information about uh, the risk is extremely important uh, to increase the uh, com compliance of people. Another factor is uh, trust in science. And uh, um, communication was often left uh, to the uh, so-called scientific and technical uh, committee. Uh, Professor Riquel is part of this committee. And uh, the people uh, uh, found an answer to their uncertainty, uh, looking at the competence of the people. Uh, the message was not uh, presented only by politicians, uh, but it was very appreciated uh, to have a message from uh, uh, scientists. Uh, there is also, uh, there are some data about the relevance uh, of trust in politician and political be uh, belief. Uh, I must say that uh, uh, um, at the moment in Italy, the confidence in the prime minister and the ministry, minister of health is very high. And this also helps. Uh, it's interesting about the political belief uh, um, a study which was made by Marcus Painter and Tian Q, uh, looking at the compliance uh, in Democrats and Republicans in US. And uh, uh, compliance was different uh, in that group. Uh, I will not say since there are elections now where the compliance was more, but I can say that the conclusion uh, of this study was that uh, it is extremely important that, that there is a, a bipartisan support for the actions uh, and measures uh, which are being presented. Because if there is a political fight, uh, this creates confusion uh, in the people and compliance will be reduced. And finally, I would like to mention the relevance uh, uh, of uh, communication and persuasion uh, on the people. Uh, there is uh, a study uh, from uh, Guglielmo Bouchez and co worker uh, about uh, uh, the relevance of the communication about the duration of lockdown. Uh, if the lockdown, the announced lockout, lockdown, has a duration longer than the people expect, compliance uh, is reduced. So, uh, for example, the announcement for a six months lockdown will induce uh, some, uh, uh, possibly, some reaction in people and say it's too long and the, uh, uh, the compliance could be reduced. So I think that these are all factors that are important uh, uh, to make measures effective. Uh, because the, uh, the measure can be sound, but if the people are not compliant to them, the, there will be no effect. Thank you, Professor Bonini. And that's certainly reflecting what I'm seeing in my post box at the moment with my constituents who are bulking at, at six months as well. So that's very interesting that that's coming from research. Um, I'll come to Professor Pillai for his initial thoughts. Um, I just also want to say, uh, because we've got three on the panel and just 
uh, 40 minutes left uh, for people to aim to be a bit uh, shorter in their answers. We really want to get to all of your knowledge as much as we can in this session, and I wouldn't want to leave anything out. Um, but Professor Pillai, just your initial uh, impressions of, of how well we're doing at the moment. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I'll be brief. Um, I, I concur a lot with uh, uh, Professor Benini and Raquel's sort of thoughts. Um, in, in essence, I think our response has been poor. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, all the data points to that. Um, and, and of course, there's a whole range of different aspects of the response, but I'll try and be as succinct as possible. And I think it comes down to, um, uh, number one, um, a dysfunctional relationship between um, what is called science and our political class, our political, our civil service infrastructure, I think has been um, uh, really challenged by, by, by this. And I think COVID has, has identified some key fault lines within UK political society uh, in, terms of, in terms of the response, um, uh, exemplified by the sort of the, 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 the speed with which right at the beginning, um, uh, politicians uh, talked about, we are following the science with really very, very little understanding of what that means. I don't, uh, I don't want to be a sound of offensive in any way, and I, I don't mean that, but, but basically what this has un uncovered is a, t a scientific illiteracy within our political class, which has meant that relationships between science advice into policy have been fraught with problems. Um, and and uh, uh, manifesting, I think, in in for instance, the, the the problems we still have with test and trace. So that's one thing. Uh, and the second um, uh, is is something that came up in in the session earlier on. I, I do think we've we've um, had taken a sort of British or maybe more correctly English exceptionalism approach to this in terms of um, assuming we are back you know, uh, 20, 30 years where, where in fact, you know, um, the UK and the US were the leaders of science in the world. And, the, and, and uh, our universities are still up there in the top 10, but there's no doubt there was a delay in, in seeking advice from those countries, um, including Italy, where, where, where um, uh, this experience had, had already happened. And also an assumption that almost like the intellectual basis of the scientific response um, remained in the UK. Um, uh, as an example, certainly infectious diseases epidemiology has a long and strong history within the UK, particularly modelling, um, but the predominance of that approach within the scientific advice may also have limited our ability to really implement a, what in essence was needed a public health approach and an integrated public health approach. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. And picking up, I'm sure, on that theme, Lord Strasburger. Thank you, Leila, and, and welcome to our three panellists. Um, I, I want to focus in on communication by the governments, the Italian and the British governments, to their populations. Um, what differences have you observed in uh, the way the two governments have gone about it in terms of things like openness and transparency, and, and even, dare I say it, um, trustworthiness. Um, the, there are people in this country who, who believe that uh, Mr. Cummings' eye test excursion to Barnard Castle has, has had an impact on public trust and compliance. Um, perhaps, uh, Professor Ricaldi, if you could try and answer that. No, thank you. Um, I think that, at least in Italy, the public trust was enhanced by the fact that the situation was really perceived as a dramatic situation, as something which is, was life or death. Uh, that perception will increase the trust in the politicians and uh, the Ministry of Health immediately uh, organized this uh, strategic committee, which is called, uh, is a technical organ that on a daily basis was meeting, was briefing the minister, and at six o'clock every day, one of the member of this committee was together with the member of the government to tell the people on the television how many deaths, how many people admitted, uh, which were the progress, which were the, the, the problems. So that happened for two and a half months every day at 6 p.m. Now, 
there was a communication from one of the member of the government and in just close, sitting close by, there was one of the members of this technical committee. And I think that was like a, um, a picture that was uh, bringing to the people through the television, the fact that the government was listening to people that was trying to do their best in a situation which was unprecedented, unprecedented for the country. So that increased a lot uh, the confidence and reduced the distance between the political, the politicians and, and the people that was uh, sitting at home trying to understand what was happening. Again, we closed every school in the country, even for regions, with basically zero cases. And there was no complaining because the people was believing and trusting in what was trying to do. And I think that that early close and not reopening of the, the schools was one of the key factor in getting down the number of cases very quickly and very dramatically. So that, that was way my, I, I'm, not sure, I'm not really sure about the UK, of course, because I, I'm not living in the UK anymore, but I was listening to the BBC or watching uh, to the BBC, my impression was a little bit of a distance uh, right. between the politicians and, and, and the people sitting at home. That was my impression, but it was just an impression from, from here. You seem to be saying that the, the tragic early bad start for Italy uh, actually worked in favour in terms of convincing the public to comply. Yeah. Right. Okay, thank you, Leila. Thank you very much. Um, if I can now quickly go to Philippa Whitford and then uh, after that to Barbara Keeley. Um, thanks very much, Leila. It was really just to come in on the, the issue of briefings because obviously health is devolved. So the four nations have, have handled things uh, slightly differently. Um, our first minister has continued briefings that are largely Monday to Friday throughout and is still doing them with our chief medical officer, with our health minister or other experts. But she actually has come under a lot of attack from other politicians in Scotland saying, oh, she's getting too much coverage. The briefings from the UK government in London stopped quite a long time ago, back in May, I think it was. Do you think having these regular daily briefings where, if you like, the leader is there looking down the camera facing journalist questions or public questions are central to that? Um, who, whoever would like to take that? Maybe, Maybe Professor Richelli? Just very briefly, because I've been taking part in those briefings. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prime Minister or the Minister of, La of Health uh, was not part of these briefings. Okay. Never appeared. Okay. It was just the image of someone uh, trying to do their best. Of course, that was a kind of, uh, so the ministry was there and the prime minister was there, but not in presence. But everyone knew that there was something that was, they, they were willing to do, they were willing to, to mm -hmm. happen. But the faces, if you want on the screen, uh, the, there was not the, the faces of, of, of non-politicians. And I think that was one of the key factors because people at home was listening to doctors or to people trying to help or these, we have something which is called civil protection, protezione civile. It's something which is entering the field when you have a earthquake or a big disaster. Mm -hmm. And the head of this protezione civile was present at every, at every uh, meeting. So these were not perceived as political briefings, mm -hmm. but perceived as let's share the pain and, 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 what, and the suffering. I mean, ours has usually been three people. So one might be the chief medical officer or nursing officer or police or, or whoever it is, is giving the non-political side, but it has always been led by the first minister in that what they say is the scientists put forward the information, but the decision is always a political decision and she feels answerable for it. Uh, but but yours has had no politicians at all. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, if, yes, if I may comment, I think the problem at the beginning uh, in UK uh, was uh, uh, 
the approach uh, the, uh, of the scientists, uh, the concept of herd immunity, and uh, so this created uh, some confusion. Uh, I must say that I appreciate the, this uh, uh, meeting, this briefing, uh, because uh, the, uh, this meeting helped in having a unitary message. Um, but I agree uh, with uh, Professor Richeldi that there is a difference if the message comes from politician or from uh, scientist. Um, uh, for example, if you look at the United States uh, and you see what happens uh, with Donald Trump and uh, Tony Fauci, yeah, sometimes there is. Uh, so I think, but it is important uh, perhaps not to have a daily briefing because the people uh, start not to be interested. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to have, a, 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 um, for example, a weekly briefing mm -hmm. about the situation with participation of scientists uh, to inform people and to give a unitary message. Because the problem that we find that without this uh, uh, type of communication, uh, the discussion is left uh, to TV programs uh, Mm -hmm. where so-called experts uh, express uh, often uh, different and contrasting uh, messages and this creates uh, confusion. Uh, so I think it is important uh, uh, to have a, an official communication. Uh, uh, of course, it's extremely important uh, that this communication is studied in order to be really effective. At the beginning, the members of SAGE, which is the scientific advisory group, were secret. It was quite a long time. Do you think the fact that our scientists were kind of hidden behind the politicians made it difficult for people to, to trust the science that the decisions were supposedly based on? Um, in Italy, but perhaps uh, Professor Richelli can uh, uh, answer Well, maybe that. if we can just come to uh, Professor uh, Richelli then. They, they were, uh, you know, uh, um, the names of the people uh, were uh, official and transparent. Um, at the beginning, uh, uh, the minutes of the uh, committee, of the scientific committee, uh, were not made uh, public. And there was a, a lot of discussion about this, whether it was important uh, to be fully transparent. But, uh, uh, you know, Lou, I don't know if you have to comment on this aspect about... Yes, that's one of the aspects of transparency. Initially, the minutes of the meeting, of these meetings, were uh, decided by the government to be kept confidential, essentially because the modeling from the epidemiologists were presenting some uh, scenarios that were really catastrophic. Mm. Uh, and some others, there were not. Mm -hmm. But the science tells you that there are probability for one or for the other, so they will mm -hmm. have been confusing to the people. They prefer yeah. to provide a message. Now that the situation is more under control, these uh, minutes are public. Everyone can look at them. And while there is less drama or less uh, mm -hmm. Moment of suffering, collective suffering. So I think it's it, it was a wise decision to do that. I mean that that's the same here. The minutes are now published, but the fact that we didn't even know who was on the committee giving the advice. Do you think that was a a, a mistake in the early phase? Yeah, abs ab I, that would be my opinion. I mean, we were not not only public, but we were we were with our face. Yeah, I'm a pulmonologist. And, and Sergio knows very well. In those days, uh, I was put on a television where people, 66, 66 million of people in the country on lockdown, in lockdown, they were looking at that moment at 6 p.m. And mm -hmm. me, as my colleague intensivologist, uh, my colleague pediatrician, uh, another, so people were putting a face on what we were saying. And that was very transparent and very clear that we were trying to decide for the best, but nobody, nobody had the right decision to take. And that was the thing. So that was very clear and very transparent from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you. I can see Professor Pilar, you want to come in, but can I go to Barbara Healy's question? Because I think it will, it's, it's neatly coming on. We'll make sure to come to you. Uh, Barbara Healy. 
Okay, thanks, Leila. Um, Professor Bonini, uh, I was going to put this question to, but Professor Pilo too, um, because we've already heard from him about uh, this issue of, of uh, science and how it's viewed in this country and the problems with that. But you talked earlier about the importance of trust in science in Italy. So our question is, from the early stage of coronavirus here, to what extent do you feel that the response, the UK government response and the guidance to the public was actually based on scientific evidence? Um, you know, notwithstanding what we just discussed about briefings and the, and the sort of public face of that scientific evidence, but was the response and the guidance to the public based on scientific evidence? Um, it's very uh, difficult uh, for a disease, which is a new disease and uh, on which we have uh, uh, very few information uh, to have uh, evidence-based decision. Uh, in, uh, in the scientific environment, uh, we consider high-quality evidence uh, only the evidence uh, which come from interventional, randomized, uh, controlled trials. So you need an intervention, you, you have two groups, uh, for instance, uh, one with an intervention, one without, and then you check the results. Unfortunately, there, are, uh, uh, there is not this information. But, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, the recommendation, the strength of recommendation uh, should relate to the quality of evidence. So if there is no high level evidence, uh, you should not have uh, strong recommendation. You can give only suggestion. But uh, according uh, to uh, a, a new and widely accepted way to uh, evaluate evidence, uh, is, uh, sometimes evidence uh, is not related, uh, uh, the recommendations are not related to the quality of evidence. Uh, I, I want to be brief, but I should like to make the sample of a paper on uh, the usefulness of parachute to avoid damage from gravitational falls. Of course, there are no randomized controlled trials to prove that the parachute is useful. But what is the effect if you use the parachute or not? Is survival or death? So extremely important also the outcome of the measure. So I think that even in the presence of a low level evidence, if the measure, the recommendation is aimed at possibly avoiding damage from a life threatening disease, I think we should accept this type of evidence. Moreover, and I conclude about this, Recommendation from regulatory bodies or from the political environment should also consider not only the level of scientific evidence, but many other factors, including the cost, the burden for individual and societies, and with an approach of the One Health, which is definitely more complex than only scientific evidence. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Pila, shall we come to you now? Um, thanks. It, with regard to communication, as, as, as the questions have focused on, um, it, is, it does come down to trust, I think, um, whether it is scientists producing that, um, that, that daily or weekly uh, uh, communication or its politicians. And I point to different situations outside of Italy so, and, and the UK. So, for instance, in Greece, um, uh, the lead scientist, epidemiology, is the, epidemiologist, is the person, the front of, of information um, and has been very successful, is very well thought of by the population. And, you know, the response in Greece has been superb to COVID. But, I mean, in, in Germany, the, the well-documented um, uh, exposition by Angela Merkel about infectious diseases epidemiology that went down very well because she had the ability to do that from a physics background and, and, and so forth. So I think any way that communication is, is, is made is, is, is important. Um, of course, science 
Um, uh, the, the, the problem with saying we're following the science is that science does bring uncertainty. And so there needs to be a sort of careful communication of that uncertainty with the population. But ultimately, it's about trust, because this, this infection requires us all to change our behavior. Uh, um, and, and this is one of the problems we may come to this. But one of the problems I have with with um, uh, an increasing um, talk about it's science that will get us out of this. Um, I, I think I have worries about that because in the end, it will all always be down to us as behavior, how we, how we um, protect ourselves from infection, protect ourselves from infecting others. So um, I, I think the whole communication issue is, comes down to how best the population can trust those who are making decisions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I've, I've got a follow-up question, really, a slightly different one. Um, can you also comment on other governments adopting a zero COVID strategy and what difference that has been making to outcomes, uh, if you've got thoughts on that? Should I just kick off with, with, with that, Barbara? Yes, yes, please. Yeah. So, so I, and within, uh, I sit within Independent Sage, um, who do do weekly uh, press conferences now, um, in, in, uh, to, to provide some sort of um, information feed. Um, we have developed um, our, that concept uh, and we pushed the argument of zero COVID, not because we think it is possible and, and likely that we will eradicate this infection. I mean, uh, you know, very few infections. Smallpox is the only infection that has really been uh, eradicated from the world. Um, and the nature of this infection means that it will continue. But what the term zero COVID for us means is that we shouldn't, we shouldn't tolerate just, just, you know, just fiddling around at the edges or just limiting infections to young people and so forth. We should actually have a strategy um, which uh, goes for every infection, isolate, find them, isolate them, isolate contacts, support those contacts to allow that to happen in order that we can limit the, um, the adverse consequences of, of, of this. Um, and uh, just this morning, listen, those of you in the UK um, listening to the Today programme, of course, we're still having debates about this thing eight months in. You know, we had two professors, one of whom from SAGE and another one um, uh, outside arguing for different approaches to this. And it demonstrates that we still, you know, we still need to be pushing very firmly within the UK to go for a much more aggressive approach, because that is the way that we will limit the, 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 the um, adverse consequences that we saw in the first wave. It doesn't mean we will eliminate it altogether. And of course, vaccines may help in the longer term. But nevertheless, we need to be more on par with what's happening with our colleagues and friends in Italy and elsewhere. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Professor Benini, any thoughts on that particular question? Um, countries adopting a zero COVID strategy, what difference that makes to the outcomes? I think I cannot answer this uh, uh, because uh, we have not uh, yet the, uh, the outcomes of different policy and so on. But I, I fully agree uh, with Professor Pillai that uh, this should be the way to go. Is uh, uh, of course uh, uh, zero COVID uh, is uh, extremely ambitious. Uh, but I think it will help to get more control of the disease uh, with an ambitious program. Professor Riccaldi, do you want to comment on that at all? Uh, I think, I think, uh, I, I agree on the strategy. I, I agree on what Professor Pile said and, and Sergio said. I think it's the focus currently, in it, at least in Italy, is really on uh, uh, people being admitted to the hospital. Uh, and we have been seeing for the last uh, six weeks uh, every day an increase in the people admitted to hospital because of COVID-19. Now these people, most people will recover, but I think this is something which is very clear to people. So uh, I think zero COVID is telling there is no virus around, that means but there is this idea that the virus can be just nothing. So it's like a flu. 
And when you think of people being admitted to the hospital and staying in the hospital, and because of that being uh, isolated, and when they go back, they have to be quarantined, and they cannot have any contact with their uh, family members. Uh, and clearly, that's, I think, currently that's the, in my opinion, for, for speaking with many people, uh, that's something which is keeping uh, most of the population compliant with the rules that we have. That, that, that would be my, I, I, ideally would be zero people in the hospital with COVID. And we never had that, never ever, uh, since the beginning. We never had one single day with zero people with COVID-19 in the hospital here. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Lord Russell. Yes, could we move on now to, uh, to, to the promise of uh, the vaccine or the combination of vaccines? Um, as we've seen in the United States of America, there is an awful temptation for some politicians um, faced with some of the problems um, to try and promise uh, what is almost certainly undeliverable in terms of the vaccine solving everything. Uh, so th the first question is, um, how realistic do you think uh, the development of a vaccine or a combination of vaccines is? Nice. Uh, yeah, his, it looks like the internet's gone, but Professor Pillai, do you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, um, uh, th thanks Lord Russell. Well, um, vaccines have been the answer to many infectious diseases. Um, as I mentioned earlier, smallpox is the only infection that has actually been uh, eliminated, eradicated from the world um, uh, due, due to, to, to vaccine. But all the other um, uh, infections that we have uh, still exist. And uh, uh, we've got to understand basically that we are, uh, when it comes to infections, you know, the infections have no borders. So as long as the infection is present in one part of the world, um, we're all at risk. So I, I say that as a, as a sort of st start off. Um, number two, with regard to vaccines, I've got to really applaud the um, scientific and um, multilateral agencies that have been preparing for vaccine production for pandemic. It, perhaps the one example where pandemic planning has shown um, some benefit uh, 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 at the WHO, UN levels and so forth. Um, and, and we are very quickly into um, phase three trials of, of vaccines compared, you know, considering the, 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 the infection was only identified eight months ago. Having said that, having said that, um, vaccines uh, um, need to be considered in the context of what is their likely benefit. Um, when, when we started, with COVID, um, the talk was we need to wait for a vaccine and the vaccine will help us eliminate the virus because we would then get the sort of herd immunity, vaccine-induced herd immunity that would just kill it dead from circulating. As time has gone on and trials have started to demonstrate how the vaccine is going to work, it's looking increasingly like these vaccines will not work in that mode, but rather they will be um, uh, beneficial perhaps more like the flu vaccine of protecting those most vulnerable. Um, and, and so I think we need to also scale what our ambition is. This is not going to be vaccines will eliminate the virus. It will be vaccines could potentially protect those that are most vulnerable and even those not 100 percent. We, of course, await the clinical trial data, um, um, which will take some time to, to come, um, uh, you know, uh, perhaps later this year or early next year. So um, that's number one. Number two, quickly, is that as we've learned from test and trace around the world, is that um, technology is only as useful as having the infrastructure to make sure it can be delivered. Um, and, um, and, and that's something that we worry about, not only because of the limitation of ability to produce vaccines for everyone, but actually how that could be actually implemented across the world. Um, and so those are the constraints to my mind. Um, and I think that it's important that the communication of that, of, of that to people is, is, is made 
to, to reduce the risks of unwarranted expectation here, and also underlining the importance of continuing public health approaches to limit the virus infection. Thanks. Oh, there he goes. Um, Professor Bonini and then Professor Ricaldi, do you want to come in on, on that? How important is that? Just I briefly, I was seconded for four years at the European Medicine Agency. And uh, even uh, with uh, fast track procedures for uh, uh, emergency drugs, uh, it took uh, at least three or four years uh, before approval. So even uh, if we consider these exceptional circumstances, uh, I think that uh, it will take time to have a, a phase three trial, particularly on a large number of subjects, uh, with an outcome which is not uh, the cure of a disease, but the, is the uh, occurrence, uh, the incidence of infections. And uh, for this reason, the, uh, the study can be made only in some countries uh, where uh, the prevalence uh, of infection is very high. So I think that, uh, um, as uh, um, Simon Russell said, uh, is that uh, there is a race and political reason uh, to push uh, for vaccine. But sometimes uh, the results which are published uh, are just preliminary results. Just think, for example, the um, uh, Russian vaccines. It was published in Lancet, uh, but it was a phase uh, two trials. So, uh, and uh, uh, the same is uh, even uh, the more advanced uh, uh, products which are uh, in preparation are still in phase three. So I think uh, uh, to answer the question, I do not think that uh, it is realistic uh, to uh, expect uh, uh, approvals uh, uh, from at least the EMA or FDA uh, before uh, 2021, uh, hopefully. Thank you very much. And in the light of that, Professor Ricaldi, I mean, uh, how do you communicate this in, to the wider public that if a vaccine is potentially not going to be uh, this year, how do we continue to get them to, to hope and comply? I, I don't know how to answer that question. What I can tell you is that in my daily practice, uh, meeting people and patients, the hope for a vaccine is keeping most of people compliant with the current rules. So I don't know when and if an effective vaccine will be developed because we still do not have a vaccine, let's say for HIV infection. Uh, so I'm not sure that if, if there will be, but what I know is that as of today, I don't feel like um, um, making the projection of a vaccine negative will help. Uh, I think quite the opposite. So I think, of course, it, it will be, I think it's, it's irresponsible to say we are going to have a vaccine on the 2nd of November. That's clearly irresponsible. But to keep very high the hopes in the population, I think is helping to make people more compliant with the rules that we have on social distancing, use of masks and so on. That's very um, insightful. The hope of a vaccine is uh, potentially as effective in the short term as uh, whether it's not going to happen uh, or, or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, Lord Russell, you're back. A, a fuse uh, tripped, apparently. Um, do you have any follow up uh, questions uh, on this matter before we go to Barbara Keeley? No, I, mean, I, I think you know, we, we just have to look across at what's happening in the United States at the moment with you know, an, an imminent election to see the temptation, the awful temptation that there is for some politicians to try and divert attention from problems today for some sort of wonderful future tomorrow, which almost certainly medically is, is undeliverable within the timescales that politicians would like to imply. And I think that is, you know, that, that is a lesson for us all, but I think is particularly a lesson for us in the United Kingdom where over-optimism by certain leaders um, has again and again proved to be uh, 
a mistake. So that is a comment rather than a question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara Keeley. Uh, I, I asked my question earlier. Uh, oh, yeah. oh I, forgive me. I thought uh, you were going to take the very last one. That's my fault. I'll ask it though. Um, uh, so on the vaccine and just, just where we are now, um, second wave is coming um, with potentials of future second waves. I mean, at, what is the optimal time for such a vaccine to be uh, sort of rolled out in, in the population? Is it does it go hand in hand with trying to get cases as low as possible as part of a zero COVID strategy and then you start vaccinating or does it not matter? Is it just as quickly as it comes? And perhaps that to, to Professor Pillai. Um, thanks. Uh, yes, uh, um, uh, as soon as the vaccine comes, and I'm assuming now the assumptions here is that, is that we understand in whom it works best um, and and with a goal, of course, to limit mortality. I think that's that's clear. We need uh, that's the, that's the problem. If 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 this virus did not cause symptoms in anybody or was only mildly symptomatic, but certainly didn't lead to hospitalizations, we wouldn't be worrying about it. So our our main worry is 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 that group, and and of course that depends on us having a very clear understanding of who are those that, that, that are most at risk, whether it's due, due to age, whether it's due to um, uh, co, 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 comorbidities, um, ethnicity, uh, and a whole range of other gender and a whole range of other things. So I think that will be, um, that, that will be the process. Um, within the UK, of course, we have the Joint Committee um, uh, for Vaccines and Immunisation that, um, that are, are responsible for identifying um, how this will be given. Um, if a vaccine does it is forthcoming, I think we need to consider it um, in the same way that we think of flu vaccines, of getting it every year, because um, it's very likely that it, it, it immunity will not be long long lasting, even if it is successful in the short short term. So this becomes something that uh, that, that that would would more likely be rolled into the routine you know immunization for those at highest risk and i think flu is a good example of the paradigm in which that could be um, um implemented thank you Thanks. that's very uh, insightful because that's rather different i think to what people are hoping the vaccine is going to be which is a take it once and it won't come back so th there's a mind shift that that needs to change there um so uh we Coming to the end of our session, and uh, I'll end uh, with asking all three of you, uh, we are at the beginning of what looks like a second wave in the UK. If you had advice for our government uh, that we can certainly pass on in the form of a letter or, or otherwise, uh, what would it be? What advice would you be giving uh, Professor Whitty and Professor Valance and, and Boris Johnson and others uh, in this moment right now? But we'll start with Professor Riccaldi and then Professor Bonini and then finally uh, Professor Pillai. I mean, my suggestion will be uh, probably a suggestion which is actually going exactly in the opposite direction of what the UK government is moving on. So that would be to look for some type of coordina coordination with the other European countries. This is really scary because what I see in the newspaper is a sort of ranking of different countries in, the, in Europe. Uh, with Spain better than the UK, UK better than Italy, and Italy moving up and then moving down. And this is creating confusion, is creating a false uh, uh, image of, of the epidemics, because of course we know very, it, it depends how much people you find with the infection, it depends how many people you test and which people you test and in which setting you test them. Uh, so we know that very well, right? But in the, in the opinion, in the public opinion, this is making things different. So I will strongly uh, advise the UK government, even if uh, Brexit, I think, happened already, uh, to try to fight for uh, something which has to be coordinated to the uh, continental level, at least. Because it doesn't make sense to me that every nation go in different situation trying to do things which are uh, tailored to a specific situation because Professor Pillay said very well he's a virologist he knows that the viruses do not do not have a, do not need a passport to cross the borders and so I think that would be my advice I don't know if it's a realistic one 
But in this setting, I think we, it's something which would be very important. Thank you very much, Professor Bonini. Yeah, I fully agree with this uh, international uh, vision uh, of science uh, and uh, healthcare and the need of uh, cooperation. This is uh, true also, uh, from, not only for, because we just discussed the vaccines, but there are over 1,000 uh, clinical trials uh, on uh, uh, drugs, uh, and not only new drugs, also drugs uh, which are already uh, uh, approved for other indications. And uh, the results of these studies will uh, come out only from uh, international uh, multicenter trials uh, with international collaboration. So I think that uh, uh, I fully agree with uh, Luca Richelbi. Uh, there should be uh, the message should be international collaboration uh, and not uh, competition to be the first or to be the best. Because uh, um, and the, the only message uh, could be not only to uh, should be to the governments but should be also to the people uh, to learn what from what happened in other countries uh, and, uh, and therefore to be compliant uh, to this uh, simple measure because uh, this will definitely help. Thank you very much. And finally, Professor Pillai. Thanks. Uh, well, in addition to that, that sort of more internationalist view, which I fully adhere to, I think um, two things. Um, first of all, this infection is predominantly, almost overwhelmingly spread in indoor settings between people. So I think uh, the constraints are far too weak at the moment and that needs to be strengthened. But secondly, um, it would be an appeal to Baroness Dido Harding is bring, bring all the agencies together, get a national consortium of NHS laboratories, uh, PHE, public health and private laboratories, um, you know, and, and a strategy that really about testing extensively, identifying people and supporting people to isolate, but through a structure, an integrated structure. One of the problems we've, 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 that's emerged in the UK is this complete hodgepodge of, um, of sampling people, drive-in centres, different laboratories, different tra tracing systems, and that is now failing. And we're not going to get out of this unless we embed that public health integrated approach into whatever our future pandemic planning is. So um, that is an appeal and I think it's not too late for such a consortium to be developed. That's incredibly helpful. Well, that brings us just one minute over the end of the session, uh, which is a chair I consider success. Um, but more than that uh, is to thank our, our three witnesses for what has been an absolutely fascinating hour. And uh, I, we could spend days listening to your knowledge and I, I do wish uh, that the government would listen a lot more to, to your knowledge. And uh, the point of our, uh, our group is to try and raise some of these issues uh, with them. So it just leaves me to say a, a massive thank you to you for giving us your time today. A big thank you to our parliamentarians for their questions. A thank you to those who have been watching or watching back on the various channels that this is broadcast from. Um, this is the end of this arc of, of sessions for the uh, coronavirus APPG. Uh, we will be releasing our full set of recommendations as has been gathered uh, over these uh, eight evidence sessions uh, since uh, we uh, had the hiatus after that first wave died down uh, and the inception of this group. And that will be coming out at the beginning of October. Uh, so thank you everybody and uh, take care, stay safe. Goodbye.